Good deal. But, uh, but it's going to fit right in with the message I was assigned. Okay. Family issues, family structure. I'm so happy this year to see so many younger families. We've got a ton of kids here. Uh, kids are wonderful. Uh, they're a heritage from the Lord. Amen. And uh, I see so many little babies around here. And I remember my children when they were little, you know, I still remember that smell that they have, the infants. It smells like baby lotion and spit, you know. <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're wonderful. And then I like two and three years old was like my favorite age because they come and they, they sit on your lap and you're rocking them and stuff, you know, and you fall asleep and your wife's taking pictures with your mouth open and, and, and all that stuff. And they're just wonderful at the time. They cuddle with you and everything. And then uh, about four or five, they think they're just hot stuff when they get to go with you by themselves somewhere and do something, you know. And, uh, and, and you reach down and they hold your hand. And they're unashamed of you. And you're unashamed of them. You know? <laughs> and, so, and then, you know, 11, 12 comes along, 13, right in that neck of the woods. Uh, I, I, have, I have a phrase that I coined for that particular age range. Uh, I call them ILFs. Uh, I, I, it happened to me at camp years ago when I had to deal with the intermediate group of, of young people. ILFs are intermediate life forms. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's kind of, you know, the, the ones that used to smell like baby lotion and baby spit. Now they've got BO and pimples and, uh, and an attitude. And one minute they love you, and the next minute they hate you, you know, and hormonal changes are taking place, you see. And then, uh, you know, you can, uh, at that point, if you're not careful, you can lose connection with your kids, you know, because things are dragging them all over the place. Peer pressure, hormones, all that stuff is changing. And so, uh, you know, how do you, how do you uh, stay connected? And if you did lose that connection, can you get it back? And the answer is yes. Okay. And, and, a, lot, and a lot of us going to, now, now kids, kids are not stupid. Even when they're little, uh, they're observing you. Okay. And the reason a lot of kids uh, find that the church may not be interesting or exciting or the things of the Lord are exciting and interesting and so forth, you know, and everything else is, is because they live with you. Amen. Go ahead. You know. The, they, they, they grow up in your house. And uh, uh, being a pastor for so many years, and even being a church door for many years, taking my kids and family to church on Sunday, <laughs> oh, here we're church, and I put the smile on, you know, put the face on, and walk in and act like everything's great. Yeah. And you just had an argument in a car going to church, you know. Yeah. And, then, uh, and, and then when you're going there and, and getting ready, come on, hurry up, it's time to go to church today, you know. And uh, hope the preacher's not long-winded because there's a Vikings-Packers game on later on, you know. And so, what do you expect, you know? And for a, for a lot of young people I talk to, and you see this even in the statistics today, how that people who grow up even in the church and in youth groups and so forth, when they leave home, they drift away. 80, 70, 80 percent don't want to have anything else left to do with it. And you find out that uh, living a life of a quote, good Christian life without passion is not something they want to repeat. Does that make sense? Amen. To have a life without passion and purpose to it. Amen. Who who's wants that? Uh, I learned a long time ago that there's two things that every person needs whether they realize it or not. Number one, to love and be loved. That's, a, that's, right at, our, that's at our core. And then there are two, to know that there's a purpose for your life. I want to tell you something. God had a purpose when he made human beings. Amen. See, when he, when he formed Adam there, he gave him a purpose in life. It, and, and, it, and it was to, to be a, a participating imager of God. Amen. Okay, and, and that's what I'm going to go into this morning. So with the issue of family issues, you want to know how to be a godly dad? If you understand this, that will help you do that. Want we'll to be a godly mother? Who knows how to raise children, love your husband, and so forth. If you understand this, it's going to help you with that. Want to be a godly aunt, uncle, individual, a married person, single person, whatever, Christian person? Because this is going to help do that. Uh, I, I did this this morning because it's a burden on my heart. And it doesn't happen here. For years, I have dealt with grace believers and other peoples of different other denominations who struggle with what I'm going to try 
and you pray for me. I want to be able to explain this in such a way because sometimes it's so fine figuring out how to live the Christian life, how to walk the walk. It's sometimes it's hard to kind of figure out. Uh, I was sharing with a couple of people here uh, for years. I, sp I spent 40 years in youth ministry at camps and so forth, and invariably, there was, I always dealt with seniors, uh, teenagers, and uh, invariably, it, one or two every year would come and say privately, Mr. Gabbard, I know what a Christian is supposed to be like. I know how we're supposed to behave and so forth. I can't figure out how to do it. How do you do that? Uh, walk in the Spirit. How? You know, uh, live unto God. Not your, how? You know? And so, you know, the things that you have believed and received and seen in me, do, and the peace of God shall be with you. How do you do the do, you know? And I struggled with that same issue for years before I came to an understanding of how, how, what that walk is all about, see? And so I, that's what I want to do for you this morning. And like I said, if you get this, you'll know better how to raise your family, and you know what they'll see in you? They'll see an example of a life that has passion and interest and meaning and purpose behind it, okay? But this is where it has to start. It basically has to start with the ending of yourself and getting into what God has for you alone, okay? Okay? So, uh, I'm going, and I, I, was, I was happy to see the, the young guys, uh, you know, who were preaching this morning and somebody, Justin said, well, he took most of your material there. Fantastic, you know, it bears repeating too, you know. And so uh, two, two basic principles of, I don't know what I'm supposed to have to do here, but I'm going to have to use this mic. Grace always demands the response of faith. They're like hand in glove. Grace is designed to work through a response of belief. See, God says something, but like, uh, go out and build an ark, man. And he was just uh, uh, faithful enough to go out and do that. Abram, come out of your land. Okay, I believe you. Okay. Uh, Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Can you believe that? Well, then you'll pass from death to life, spiritually speaking, right? Now, what about, what about as believers? Uh, how do we then walk? Colossians chapter 2, 6, and 7, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but as you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, how'd you do that? By grace, through faith. You responded to an offer that God made, okay? How are you going to walk? Oh, well, God has done his, I heard this all my life coming up in the Baptist church. Now, God has done his part, time for you to do your part, okay? And I've relayed this story, I, I, I told this story in West Virginia, and I'll share it with you guys who, that I haven't before. Uh, when, I, when I first came into the Grace Message, I was going to church up at Grace Bible Church in Bruce, Wisconsin, where I pastored for 30 years and where Brother Bill is now. But uh, uh, coming out of the baggage that I had denominationally, I'd get up, they asked me, I, I started teaching Sunday school, you know, after only been in it like a year. So I'm throwing out a bunch of stuff that's still steeped in some of that baggage I've got. And uh, yeah, now, you know, God's done his part. Now it's time for us to do ours and we can do these things, you know, and we're, we're to walk in the spirit and all that kind of thing. And there was an older gentleman there named Ben Roach. And he'd sit right over there. And I'd start talking that stuff and he'd go, yeah, Ben, what you need? He said, I can't do that. And that's all he'd say. He wouldn't explain. I can't do that. What do you mean, man? Yeah, we can do it. We can do it for the Lord, you know. We can get online here on the main line, just going full speed ahead and do for God, you know. And he said, yeah, yeah, but I can't do that. I'm like, Argh! you know. And every Sunday, if I got off into that stuff, what, Ben? I can't do that. I said, what a, what's the matter with this guy? I want to choke him, you know. And he's like, and so... But, but people like that, uh, uh, people like that who would challenge me, yeah. it always made me go study more, you know. And so, and so I'm looking, Philippians 2.13. Go over there for a minute. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12. Let me get my Bible too, so I don't mis misquote.
Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Now watch this. And I'll put it together. Uh, 13 is the key verse, but let's begin in 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. You've got to work for, for your justification. Is that what's going on there? No, no, no. This isn't about justification. This is working out that, that issue of, of practical sanctification and functional living unto God in this thing. Work this out with fear and trembling. How do I do that? <laughs> you know, for it is God which worketh in you to do what? Two things. To will and to do. It's not my will. Not by doing. But I'll tell you what. For a long time, my Christian experience, hey, God did his part, now I'm doing my part. My will, my doing, my energy, my wherewithal, my perseverance, I'm doing for God. And then when I'd fall down and fail on that, guilt, condemnation on myself. I failed God. I've let Him down. I've failed in my mission. I, my plans fell through. The things I wanted for the youth group didn't work. What's the matter with people that are not following my instruction and becoming more godly like me? I had that attitude. I said that to a youth group one time. I said, I just want you to be as spiritual as I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I thought about it twice. I said, hmm, maybe that's not so good. Maybe some of them are probably more already. <laughs> and, so, and so that's the attitude. Yeah, I'm doing for God. And you read this verse. No, I can't do that. <laughs> and so I figured out what old Ben was trying to teach me there every Sunday. When he'd raise his little finger, you know. <laughs> For it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, not mine. I have to align my will and understand God's purpose that for, for himself. That was a big deal, too, back in the 70s. So there were books came out. I, in fact, I had one, 10 Steps to Knowing How to Follow the Lord or something like that. And uh, this whole thing of uh, figuring out plans and ideas to be able to accomplish this walk in, the things, in this list of things that you made to do, see. It's nonsense. It is God which worketh in you, both the will and do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as what? Lights in the world. How are you going to shine as a light? You have to realize you can't do that but there's someone who can, okay? And so when we get up there, the, the grace through faith demands a response. The word, somebody, I think it was a, a brother, uh, who was the first speaker there? Where'd he go? Yeah. The word never part, uh, works apart from the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit cannot work effectively in your life without a proper understanding of the Word of God. Now, you, you can have a foolish understanding, and a lot of people do, Okay, but the Spirit is not into foolishness. See, He works through a proper understanding of the Word of God. Ephesians teaches us all that. So you've got that going on. Look at First Thessalonians chapter two with me. First Thessalonians two ten through thirteen. First Thessalonians two ten through thirteen. First Thessalonians two ten through thirteen. Now, if you get tired or something back there, you can use the old trick, my, the, a trip that my, uh, my friend Bill Pugh, he's an old cowboy, uh, he, he's dozed off all the time, so he would, he would hold one leg up when he was in a service, and when he got sleepy, it would drop and wake him up, so, yeah, but uh, you, you can do that, <laughs> or you can go stand against the wall or something, but don't go to sleep on this, this is the important stuff, you got to figure out what we're about here, you know, we got a purpose that God gave us. Anyway, chapter, uh, verse 10, ye are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and blamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Paul's an example, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children to do what? Here's your purpose clause, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it, 
So see, see the reception there because of somebody's there to give it. But now they're receiving it for themselves. You received it personally here, not as the word of men, but as is in truth what? The word of God, which does what? Effectually worketh also in you that do what? Believe. believe. It comes down to the issue of belief. How did you get saved? You believe the gospel. Yeah. How are you going to walk in the Spirit? You're going to have to believe some stuff. Yeah. Believers get in trouble when they fail to believe the Word of God. That's just, that, that, how, how profound is that? Yeah. Okay? We get in trouble as believers, as God's saints, when we just fail to believe the Word of God. Okay? Uh, confusion reigns. It's reigned for 2,000 years of church history. And the only way you're going to fight that confusion, number one, is to understand the Scripture in its, in its rightly divided form, to be able to, to distinguish things that are excellent and so forth and make proper division of Israel, body of Christ, uh, mystery, prophet, all that kind of thing. But, but be careful in your study of Scripture that you don't make the distinctions too much because there are great connections between God's two purposes Amen. in those two places with those two entities or peoples, okay? Heaven and earth weren't designed to exist separate from one another. In the beginning, heaven and earth were there together. God ruling and reigning there until the rebellions came. And, and that's a whole different story. I, by the way, if you don't know what I'm into, I view, I view everything in Scripture from, a, from the aspect of spiritual warfare. Because that's raged before the world began until the end of time here, Okay. And so when you're looking at this issue, in the beginning there, God in heaven and earth made sons of God. If you ever read Luke's genealogy about Adam, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he backs up and goes back down and said, Adam, the son of God. See? God's purpose, you're talking about everybody needs a purpose, the purpose of God with His sons in the heavenly realm and in the earthly realm when he, when he started with Adam for the human race was to be fully participating imagers of God. And one, and one of the, the, the first great institution we learn about in Genesis and so forth we, was the thing called volition or will, free will. I'm, I'm not a Calvinist, see. Uh, they believe that God has to give you faith to believe and all that nonsense. But God gives, how do we know that? Go over to Genesis 126. Go to Genesis 126. Genesis 126. Now keep your thinking caps on. We'll, we'll try to make some connections here. Genesis 126. And God said, let us... I won't get into that, but that's interesting. <laughs> God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, so on and so forth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, male and female, and, and he created them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, now be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and every living thing upon the earth. See, he creates Adam as the son of God, but he doesn't create an automaton. He creates somebody with free will, and he gives them purpose out there. Now go out and do this. Here's, here's, here's your mandate. Go out and do this and replace. You know what he's wanting Adam to do when Adam is still in that state in relationship with God as an image? As, as, by the way, as a perfect, pure imager of God at this point. Right? State of innocence. You know what he wants him to do? Fill the earth up with some more people like him. Imagers of God. This making sense? Yeah. Okay. God's fill the earth up with more like me. Okay. And so that's his purpose and plan for him. Now, there's a risk involved when you grant free will to anybody or anything. Yeah. Uh, but do you think God was ready for that? Do you think he's willing to take that risk? Because what, what's the very central core nature of God who he is? God is love. And to, to have an automaton that does what you make them want to do, that's nothing more than slavery. Okay? There are people who try to control other people, even, even in marriage relationships and so forth. One spouse will try to control the other because they've got those issues. Can I tell you that's not good? Okay? It's, it's, not, it's not of God. See? It, it's, it's of the flesh and so forth. Uh, look over Colossians chapter, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 15. Colossians 1, verse 15. Colossians 1, verse 15. 
And I give you this one because here is the one who is the perfect image of God. Jesus Christ, speaking of the one that, brought, that translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, verse 14, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. Remember when Christ talks about this, uh, no man has seen God at any time. They that worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth and all that kind of thing. You can't see Him. You know where you're ever going to see God? In Christ. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay? That's where, that's where we will know God face to face, as we say. Okay? And so, uh, imagers of God. In, in, in both families, we're talking about family structure. There's a family structure in the heavenly realm. It's hierarchical in order, too. Principalities, powers, dominions, thrones, all those things that Paul talks about. Uh, there's a hierarchical structure for the family that was put in place. The second great institution God made was the institution of marriage. Okay? Man and woman come together. And then the, the third is family. you got children that come along, hopefully. See? And so what, what those are... Family and marriage are powerful weapons in the hand of God to counter the satanic policy of evil which would tend to destroy the family and has destroyed many families and is destroying many families, even amongst Christian uh, families. Okay? Uh, don't think for a minute that Satan's not interested in tearing your family apart because if you're bear, if if you're if you're if, if if it's your intent and belief as a saint to live according to grace doctrine and so forth, he's not going to leave you alone with that. He's going to attack that and try to destroy that, because that's what you're raising a gen, a, the next generation, mom and dad, to come along in the image that you're portraying in front of them. Let's pray and begin to understand that the image we're bearing before our children is the image that God originally intended for the humanity to have. Does that make sense? Because children aren't dumb. They see you every day. They live in your home. They observe you as to how you really are. The people who know who you really are are the people you live with in your home. Okay? Yeah. Uh, we look at each other and smile and say, How you doing, man? Great to be here on Sunday, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord is good, you know? Uh, yeah. And there's turmoil behind the walls of Christian families. And a lot of it has to deal with because they've never figured out how do you do that? I, 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 know, I know I'm supposed to be loving my wife you know, as Christ loved the church. I, I know I'm supposed to be raising my children in the, in the admonition of the Lord, but I keep, I keep messing that up. You know? I, mean, I, I tried really hard. You know? And we were just talking about that. The, and I'll, I'll share my struggle. Uh, when the Lord turned my life around in 1980 and I uh, came back and was, was living over in Apple Valley, Minnesota and uh, went over to Apple Valley Baptist Church. I was raised Southern Baptist so I found a Baptist church to go to. And uh, pretty soon I was so excited about the Word of God. I, I couldn't wait to get home. Every, there came a hunger for the Word of God at that point in my life I'd never had before. Every day I couldn't get, I was studying that book, man, I was excited, and I'd try to find somebody at this 200-member church to talk to, and I only found two other older men, and neither one of them was the pastor. You, you, you'd talk to people, hey, have you seen this stuff about the blood of Christ here? Yeah, that's nice. You see the football game? What? <laughs> the football game? Did you see this thing about the blood of Christ? And, and they, they, don't, they don't know how to talk to you about that, except for these two older gentlemen. Yeah, man, that's exciting stuff, you know. But uh, uh, ended up, they asked me to begin to work with a youth group. And so I'm excited to do that, you know. And so not realizing what I'm going to share here, I'm in there doing for God. I'm, I'm youth leader now, you know. And so I'd make my plans. I'd write these things out, you know. And i said, this is going to be so great. And you get with a bunch of young people and they're going, yeah, that's, that's good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, really good. <laughs> and I'd get discouraged. Why aren't they excited? Why aren't they as spiritual as me? <laughs> and, so, and so I'd go home and mope around. I would, I would enter states of depression sometimes for a couple of weeks. I uh, mean, I tried so hard and I failed, you know. 
uh, I, I wonder if God can ever really use me again. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a retard kind of a thing. You know, I, I, this is no good. And so I'd sit around like three for a couple of weeks, finally come out of that. And uh, again, when you, when you enter that state of the guilt and condemnation, you only have those two places to go. You either can quit and give up and say, this is too hard, I can't do it, I'm done. Or, as somebody who's, who really wants to live for the Lord, I'll try harder. Yeah. I'll get back on this, this, this uh, hamster wheel and I'll try harder. Yeah. And it is. And then, lo and behold, your plans fail again. Your doing fails again. See, my perseverance hits bottom. And there I am again. Man, I guess I can't be used of God anymore. I'm a failure, you know. And so I got two options. What are they? Quit. Try harder. <laughs> and it finally dawns on me one day when I read that Philippians thing there, you know, about God working. I said, I guess I just need to figure out how to trust God. <laughs> you know. And then I heard, I heard a preacher one time. He said, in the dispensation of grace, trying is out. Trusting is what is in, see. And so, grace always demands the response of faith, not just to get justified, but to walk the walk, okay? And now you get to you figure out how that works. So those verses like that, it's God doing this work. You know what's so cool about that verse? It's God's will, it's His doing. He supplies all this stuff in order to, 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 to work out. We're His workmanship, 210, we're his workmanship, you know, uh, unto good works and so forth. And his works are the works that are the good ones, not the ones we come up with. But you, but you figure that out. And a lot of stuff I came up with, it was good stuff. But it was my works. That's nothing more than religion. That's just, re that's just duty, obligation, religion. You might as well go back and say, I'm, I'm under the law. Okay, because you just made one for yourself. Brother Eric last night was talking about a lot of times, a lot of times gross people will take the, the imperatives and so forth we find in Paul's epistles and they turn that into a law. Now I've got to perform up to this in order to be a good Christian, in order to be recognized as somebody who's living the, uh, unto God and not myself. And then you finally wake up one day and, and you go, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so it, it, you talk about freedom and liberty. When, when, when that finally hit me like a ton of bricks, it's like, it's like going over and saying, wow, what a place to rest. I've been looking for this place forever. Amen. What a wonderful place of security. What, what a wonderful place of, 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 of relationship with my father. I can just follow him, trust and believe him, and it's going to be okay. That's not going to take away the trials and tribulations and struggles in life. But you know what? I got him all the time now. I'm not out here trying to do for God all by myself. Does this make sense? Is it making sense? See, uh, you can't walk the walk. But there's an empowering presence in you that can motivate that and cause that. Paul talks about the fact of the love of Christ constraineth me. For we this judge that one died for all, all were dead. The love of Christ was what constrained his ministry. He got, he got what I call the can't help it's, you know. When you get tuned into this, it's not a matter of fact. Oh man, you know, I got to go preach. I got to go to church. I got to do these things. I have to do this kind of stuff because that's what God wants me to do and that's what's going to be rewardable at the judgment seat. So I got to make this list of stuff to do so I'm going to have reward and all that. That's the way people think. Grace people think like that. I knew, I knew a lady years ago who did that. She's talking about, I know that at the, reward, at the judgment seat I want to find rewards and not have it all burned up. So I made a list of stuff I'm doing for God. And she had her list, you know. Wood, hay, and stubble, my friends. You know, it's, it is God who worketh in you. Man, when you come to that place of what I call an acknowledged dependence on that relationship with God, that's the place of rest. That's the place of security. That's the place of power, too, by the way. See, it's not that you're going to sit on the stool of do nothing because you found that. When I say rest, you're going to get worn out. You'll be burned out in ministry for the Lord. But you realize, hey, 
isn't it wonderful to know that this is God working in and through my life, through my vessel here? See, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But uh, uh, look over real, so I don't forget some of these. Go to Romans eight, uh, Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-eight. Romans eight, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Look at that real quick. Familiar passage of scripture. I'm so happy people are. Uh, you know, Barney and I have talked. This is this is the is this the ninth year, Barney? Yeah. Uh, and I've been privileged to, he's been foolish enough to let me come and speak every year. <laughs> but uh, we talk about these things all the time. And uh, it's so cool when you have a conference, you see a theme start to develop whether you had one or not. Okay. That's why I say I'm always happy to see these, these same verses cropping up because you know the Spirit of God is working in us through the same word. But uh, chapter 8 and verse uh, 28. Da, 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 da. We're here in the right chapter for, with you guys. Now, now watch this real quick. It says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and, whom are, uh, and, and them who are called according to his what? Okay. What's God's purpose? We haven't read the next verse. What's God's purpose? To be an imager of God. Okay. How are you going to do that? <laughs> okay. So read the next verse. For whom he did foreknow, he's got this purpose, he's got this plan. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Isn't it interesting where he talk about uh, he wants to have many other brethren like unto himself? Many sons, wants many sons, okay? Starting out with this one here, you know. Go out and, go out and make more, Adam. Go out and make more. But then trouble comes, and that's all knocked in the head. But he has another son. Yeah. Amen. He has another son. Yeah. You know. and, and he's the one who's going to restore and reconcile all things back to himself. You know that's what the book of Colossians is all about? He becomes, he becomes the, uh, uh, let me see my notes over here a second. Go, to, go over to Colossians with me for a minute. Colossians, I think I got a note over here on that. Colossians chapter Chapter 1, I think. Just let me run over there because I, I wrote a note in here about that whole thing about what he does. And it said, uh, he has, to, if you're familiar with the book of Colossians, the Gnostic error had cropped up in that, in that church. And they were talking, the problem, the, the reason Paul has to write Galatians, Colossians, so many other books, he has to correct errors to correct the fact that Christ is not enough. With the Gnostic problem, Christ was not not enough because there were all these other intermediary, intermediary beings and so forth. They had some weird beliefs, but Christ wasn't enough. Uh, the fullness is in other things that we know about. And by the way, if you come and see us, we can fill you in on that. We, we got the knowledge, you know, we got the gnosis. But uh, uh, Christ, he, Paul said Christ is the creator because they didn't believe that, that Jesus was the creator. The Gnostics didn't, okay? And so Paul said, no, he's the creator. He's also the sustainer of creation, and he's also the reconciler of all things, see? And so it, it, it's so cool. The purpose of God in being imagers. Ephesians 2.10, you know, uh, we're his workmanship created in, in Christ Jesus unto good works. Those good works are associated with, look up here now, those good works of Ephesians 2 are associated with what? God's purpose. Not your plans for how to bring in the kingdom, okay? with God's purpose for the body of Christ, okay? And, of course, our purpose is associated with the heavenly realm, okay, in that place. Understand that we're, Paul says, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? That word judge, by the way, is not like judging for sin. It's like governing. Do you know where Christ is seated today? If, at the right hand of the Father, above all principality and power. Guess where you're seated today? In Him, above all that. What's the problem we deal with as, as far as spiritual warfare? Ephesians chapter 6. Spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities, powers, all those things. That's what we're involved with. See, this is not just earthbound stuff of everyday living, making 9 to 5, going out and working, raising your family to be nice people and then morally and ethically straight and everything, going to church and all that kind of stuff, and, and then dying and going to heaven. Those things are good. But where's the passion in that? See? 
where do, they, where do, you, where do your children see the passion at? Yeah, I'm, I'm a good kid, but it doesn't seem very exciting. They don't know what they're involved with. If you knew what you're involved with in this issue of the, of the spiritual warfare, my goodness. Do you know what you're destined for? Do you know what even now, Ephesians 3.10, that now to the, to the intent that now unto the principies and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, which you're a part of if you're a believer, the manifold wisdom of me, of God, okay? You represent God, see? You're, 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 you're supposed to be coming more and more like the Son, that's what, that's what we read over there, conform to His. We talked about conforming and transforming. Now, that conforming, we'll be poured into that mold and made to look and be and act like Him, okay? Conform to the image of His Son. He who, is, he who is the perfect, visible image of God, okay? If you following this stuff? All right, let's, let's run on down here. We got this, and so and so again. You know, you got these good works. Yeah, you're supposed to work uh, all these good things out. You're supposed to walk the walk, talk the talk, uh, go out and witness and share, go out and teach and preach, go out and raise your families, be a godly man and woman. Brother Gabbard, I know that's all supposed to be done, but I, I can't figure out how to do that, man. I can't figure out how to do that. And and I and, I, and I, honestly, it would break my heart, because these kids were were very sincere. They're there at camp. By midweek, they're on a high being, being amongst other saints, and they're wanting to live the life. But you, but you know, almost invariably, when camp was over, and that taste of heaven on earth was, was over, and they went back home into their environment, right back down again. Same old lifestyle. See? How, how do you do it, man? I want to do it. I don't know how. And so, Colossians 2, 6, and 7 as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in Him. By grace, through faith, but then how, you got to figure out what that's all about. And that's where that issue of, uh, of Philippians 2.13 and so forth comes in. It's at the place where you learn to, to you're going to have to trust God with things. You're, you're going to have to basically give up control, okay? It's not your plans and purpose, it's His. You, then you have to come to understand what is what is God doing today? See, is He building an ark? You know, <laughs> is He offering uh, blood sacrifices on an altar? You know, uh, what's He doing today? Well, He's building the body of Christ. Well, why? And what part have I got to play in that? I'm just a student. You know, I'm just a mom. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, you're not just a mom. You're a minister of Jesus Christ to your children. Amen. Amen. Uh, you're, you're not just a, a Sunday school teacher. You're a minister of Christ to them. You're not just a, a Christian farmer, truck driver. You're a minister of Christ on the road. Okay? And what is your life and your mortal flesh showing to people who you're meeting day to day? In your home, in your community, on your job, what does it show to them through your words and your deeds? That's all you have, by the way. Your whole reputation is wrapped up in those two basic things, what you say out of your mouth and what comes out of your life. Re, 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 amen? That's, that's who you are to people. What do they see? see? And I'm going to share a story with you. It was part of the, it was part of the lesson I had anyway. But uh, there was a story about a, I shared this in our, our Sunday sermon last Sunday with our group at home there. But there was a, a graduate student who was doing, he was staying with the Navajo tribe for a year to do his doctoral thesis, and so he got to live with them for a whole year. And uh, he lived in their home, ate their own meals, got used to their culture and everything. The grandmother in this, in this home couldn't speak any English, and he couldn't speak any Navajo, but they formed a really tight bond right off the bat. They just were able to communicate in such a way that they, they learned to love one another. And so uh, uh, the time eventually came to where he had to leave and go back, and they held a going away celebration for him, and people were sad because he had become a part of their, their family and their community. And he got in a truck to leave. The, the old grandmother came up, and she, she uh, this is hard for me to say. She came up and took her hands like that on his face and looked him in the eye and said, I like me best when I'm with you. I thought, wow. 
And isn't that the way it should be with our Father? That we're best when we're Him. And I like myself best when I'm with Him. Okay? And when that's going on in my life, we can have people say about us, man, I like me best when I'm around you. you know? Dad, Mom, man, I like me best when I'm with you. I remember uh, I remember a story about a friend of mine. You know if I said his name, but uh, when when he was raising his son, he figured I, I'm gonna we're gonna let's go fishing. So he get in the habit of going fishing and stuff, you know, just to have some communion time with his boy. And because he figured that he I call him Bill, Billy. That's that's how his name is. He figured Billy liked fishing, and so he did that through his teen years and. And uh, later on, the son got married, had his own family, you know, and he got to talking about that one time in, 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 in his son's presence. He was telling me or somebody about how, how much he loved, the boy loved fishing. He says, I never did like fishing, Dad. I just like being with you, you know. That's what, that's what matters to kids, you know. That somebody... That somebody cares about them. And they know when it's fake and when it's not. Okay? They know when it's real and genuine. And so, and so you who are parents today or, or people who have young children in life, aunts and uncles and siblings and all that, uh, this stuff here, that relationship you build of trust and confidence in your father, I'll give you one other illustration. Somebody said I sh I sh it would be good to use. I used to train horses a lot and and uh, when, when, you start, when you start a young, unbroke horse off, I had a round pen. That's why I started mine. And they're in there. I don't have anything on them. I'm not holding them. They're in there free and loose. And they, they could basically care less that you're in the world. And, but, and they have no trust either. They're, they're not very trusting animals because they're basically prey animals. Other animals eat them. <laughs> but uh, you, get, you get that thing moving around, that horse moving around, and he eventually figures out I'm being controlled here. I'm not in control anymore. And now he's looking for peace and he's looking for rest and a place to, a place to be secure again. And he has to find it. And so as you work this animal in this pen, you eventually, through body language stuff, you invite them to come in to you. And eventually, and every, every one of them is a little different, takes a different time. Somebody said, how does it take to train a horse? I says, it takes as long as it takes. <laughs> but so you start and eventually that horse will come in and you'll watch him change too he's figuring things out what can I do here to find this rest and security that I need because I need, I need that uh, they're herd animals and so th the security is in being with one another and so he's trying to figure that out again with a human and eventually that horse will come in he'll, he'll, his eye will change and soften, and his head will come down, his body language come, and he'll come over, and he'll, and he'll come and put his head right here. The first, the first time that happened to me, I thought, man, you know, and, and then what happens there, they call it joining up, and so then when I turn to walk off, where he's found, he says, he found that place to rest, he found that place to rest, see, and then when I turn and walk off, that horse follows me, and I don't have nothing on him, I'm not pulling, dragging him, he doesn't have to follow me, but now he wants to. See, that's a good place. Being by this guy, that's a good place for me. See? And I use that in cowboy camps with, to illustrate that with the kids. Being next to your father and following him, that's a good place. You know? That's a place of rest and security and protection. It's a place that gives you an understanding of what your purpose is. And then you don't just wander around in life and get all guilty when your plans fail. You can just trust God with your life. Mom and Dad, if you understand how you can just trust God with your life, you'll show that to your kids. See, And they'll grow up understanding what it means when Paul says, you know, honor your father and mother, see, that your life may be long on the earth. That's interesting, isn't it? He pulls that one over there. That's the first commandment with promise that your life may be long upon the earth in the dispensation of grace. Yeah, yeah. There, there's advantages to honoring your parents. There's advantages to raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, okay? 
manifesting his image to them. Make sense? Make sense? Okay. So, so again, that whole thing to me, it's an acknowledged dependence on the Lord. And that's what ends up giving you this enablement according to his power. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 3. Ephesians 1 and, and Philippians 3. We'll, all, we'll almost be done. Hey, we're doing good. You guys hungry for lunch? Too bad. <laughs> okay. Ephesians chapter, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, did I say? Yeah, Ephesians 1 and uh, verse 19. Is that what I got up there? Yeah, verse 19 and 20. Ephesians chapter 1. And this is, this is that, that first great prayer of, that Paul has here. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to, when you figure out, you know, how can I do this? Uh, wh- wh- where's the strength and ability and, 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 and energy to do these things? It has to come from God. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who do what? Believe. Believe. Okay. Grace always new man's response of faith. According to the working of my mighty power that I've reserved for God. Okay. <laughs> According to his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. Because Now, what kind of power is this when he raised him from the dead? When I saw that years ago, I thought, do you mean the same power that resurrected Jesus is the same power that's available to me through the indwelling presence of his spirit? And I'm going, whoa, you know, you can't beat that with a stick, you know. It's, 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 like the, it's like that uh, Philippians 2.13 thing, you know. It's God who does the willing, the doing, and then you know what? He's going to reward you at the judgment seat of Christ for what He's done. Okay? Reward you for what He did. Uh, how, can, how can you beat a plan like that? You know, you can't. And so, Christ from the, and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly place. There's our position again. Where are you today? If, if you know Christ as your Savior right now, you're in Christ Jesus. Where's he? Seated above all principality and power at the right hand of the Father. And let me say this so I'm not remiss. I know in a crowd this size, there's always the possibility, more like a very strong possibility, that there are some of you here today who don't know Christ as your Savior. And it's not hard to place to have a response of faith to the grace that he supplied in giving his son on your behalf. You know, he died for you. He was buried, validating that death, and raised again, validating that the death was enough to take care of everything that's wrong with you. Cancel your sin debt, and if you'll believe that, you can pass from eternal death to eternal life right now where you sit, okay? Don't pass up an opportunity like this. If you've never trusted Christ to be your Savior, don't wait. The world's a dangerous place, and another day is not guaranteed to anybody. Amen? Okay? So trust Him as your Savior. But if you, now, for those of you who are believers, I hope you're catching on to this stuff. Okay? You, you have power available to you. Brother Gabbard, how, we, how do we do this? Well, you have power available to you. You can trust God to give you what you need to enable you to live out the in living Christ. Okay? Uh, the next one was uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3. That, that fits right in with this whole thing. What kind of power is this? Say it. Resurrection power. Say it again. Resurrection power. If you didn't say it, say it again. Resurrection power. Okay, now go to, uh, to Philippians chapter 3 and see how this fits over here. Philippians chapter 3 and ver- beginning with verse 10. And he, that I may know him. I, when I read that years ago, I'm going, oh, I, thought you, I thought you already knew him, Paul. You know. He knows him in his, in his, as, as a justified uh, person with eternal life. He's saved and so forth. But he wants to experience him. That's what this word know. You, you, we talk about knowing people, you know, or, or know, knowing the reality of, a, of, a, of, a, of an African safari. What are we saying? We experienced it, okay? I want to know him and the power of his rest. He want to know him more and more and more as each day passed. I want to know him and the power of his what? His resurrection. Okay. Not when he died by and by. He's wanting to know that right now. He's wanting to know that power. He's wanting to experience that in his person. Okay. 
and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now go over to Romans chapter 8. That, what's he mean, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead? I think Eric said something about he, That's not by and by. He's wanting, to, he's wanting to know that right now. Okay. Romans chapter 8 and verse 10. Romans 8 verse 10. Okay. Now stick with me. We're, we're almost getting, getting down here. Romans chapter 8. Yeah, verse 10. It said, If Christ be in you, you know, and, he, and He is if you're saved, the body's dead because of sin. That's what He took care of, that issue. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and He does if you're a believer, okay, you're either in Adam or in Christ. If you're in Adam, the Spirit doesn't dwell in you. But if you're in Christ, the Spirit dwells in you. That's just a given that He gives to us by His grace again, okay, for, for the body of Christ. Israel didn't have that, did they, in that program? But we do. Now watch this. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. I want you to remember that thing about your mortal bodies. That word quicken, that's an interesting word. We say quicken means to be made alive. There's more to it than that. Back in not so many decades ago, uh, when a woman first experienced uh, her child moving in the womb, it had been alive for a while. But they have the quickening. It's active. Did you get that? Now it's active. This resurrection power brings the enablement. That's the thing that makes it possible to be active in service to God. Not you doing it, again, depending on the indwelling Holy Spirit through the power of God, the same that raised Christ from the dead is the same available to you to quicken you in your mortal flesh so that now people see the, the activity that's being engaged there is showing Christ to the world through your mortal flesh. Okay? Now, I want to sh this is the last thing I've got over here. Go to first, don't go to 1 Thessalonians. I'll tell you what it says. It talks about the fact that we are spirit, soul, and body. We are, we, humanity gets that backwards. We, get, we, we focus on body, body, soul, and spirit. God, God looks at, the, at, the, at a human person from spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Go to Romans 12, 2, and also grab 2 Corinthians 3 on your way, and we'll finish this up. Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians 3. Now that spirit, soul, and body thing, that's who you are. You know, when, when you read Romans 12, 1, let's just read that. Romans 12, Son, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you prevent your soul a living sacrifice. I, uh, I beseech you that you pre present your, your, your mind a living sacrifice, your body. Uh, why does he ask for the bodies? If you've got the bodies, you've got the rest of them too. Okay, they're all in there. This is your vessel. The, the you that's you, as a believer, is made up of those three parts. And, and, they're, and they're all alive physically, spiritually, and, and emotionally, all that kind of thing. They're alive here. So you've got that going on, right? So look at verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And see, to, to me in my studies, this isn't true in every case when you define your terms, but mind is often associated with your spirit. Okay? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind for what purpose? That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have the potential in you because of the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to be living credible proof of the good things of God to your children, to your husband, to your wife, to your society, to your friends in general. You, is it, think, stop and think about that for a minute. God living in you, and, is, and, and this is where that yielding to the Spirit and stuff comes into play versus the flesh. When you're yielding to the Spirit of God, the power of resurrection is working in your life to manifest the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know where the face of Jesus Christ is today? It's in you or not. 
Grace always demands the response of faith. How were you justified? I believed. How are you going to walk? I believe in what he has, not what I've got to bring to the table. What did you have to bring to the table to find eternal life? Nothing. Okay. What, what, do you, what, do you got to, what do you got to make this walk work to the glory of God and according to his purpose? Nothing. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. But he can. See. Are you getting this? I mean, I mean, this, this, this has broken my heart so many times, talking to grace people, uh, uh, other, other denominational people. They struggle with this. I know what, it, I know what I'm supposed to be. I, maybe I've got that quote. Hang on just a second. I think I got that quote in there. Maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. There was a lady years ago I dealt with, and, she's, and I'll paraphrase what she said. She says, I know everything about what it's supposed to be that we're to live to the glory of God and everything and how that's supposed to be worked out, but I find myself not being able to do that too often. And so she struggled with that, how to, how to make that happen. Those teens, how do you make that work? Folks, it's like that horse. Once, once you discover that trust that you can have in your father, I just want to be there next to him. See? And then it's not about me having to energize or have the will to do this thing. I can trust him to do that through me. And then Christ lives out. So let's finish up with this. Second, that's, that's the 12 too. There's a transformation process as you're renewing your, how, how do you, what do you renew your mind with? The, the brothers preached on this, the Word of God. Word and the Spirit cannot work separately, okay? So the Spirit, using the, your understanding of the Word of God, works in you. It's doing a transformation in your spirit, in your mind. You're being transformed. You're being changed. We talk about conform versus transform. Conform means to take something and, and just change its form in a certain mold, but when you transform something, you're changing it into another form. Okay? You're going from this fleshly reality and everything to a spiritual renewed thing. That's taking place as the Word of God is working in your mind. As you take, let, the, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. You know? You're taking that in and it's transforming your mind. It's transforming your spirit. You're becoming more like that. You're becoming more like the Son of God. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at that, 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 3, and I want to start with verse, uh, just so we get context here about, about that issue of the heart or the soul, and you're familiar with this, remember when Moses come down, comes down off uh, from Mount Sinai and his face is all aglow, and it scared him, <laughs> and he had to put a veil over it. Because it was, he was glowing, you know. And so, but after a while, that glow faded away. But he kept the veil on his face, remember? And this is what this is about. Look at verse 13. Uh, for the, verse 12. Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. Why? So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of what is abolished. Of course, he's speaking of the law, okay? But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Every time they ventured back under the law in the Old Testament, that ve they're putting the veil back on, okay? Uh, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, watch this, the veil is upon what? Their heart, okay? So we're dealing with the heart here. And so, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's your liberty. There's your liberty. See, what people do, even with, as a brother said last night, making, a, making Paul stuff a performance standard, what people, if they can't find a law, we'll make one up. We'll put ourselves back under bondage. I mean, that's just the flesh, man. You know, put me back under that. The Galatians. 
Oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you. Freedom's scary to people, apparently. You know, a lot, a lot of you have heard these stories about people who get out of prison or a penitentiary, and they're afraid, you know. All their security is gone that they knew and realized, and now they've got to go out there, and man, it's a scary place, this freedom stuff. Man, and we have liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is. There, not bondage, there's liberty. Okay, now watch this as we go on, verse 18. But we all with open face, you know, honest, beholding as in a glass. That's like a, a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And of course, the glass is the Word of God, right? The glass is the Word of God. Beholding the glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That word change there is the same word that's uh, translated transfigured over there in the transfiguration with Jesus Christ. Wow. There's a transforming process going on in your spirit. There's a transfiguring process going on in your soul. When you look into the Word of God and see yourself as you really are. If you, you see yourself there and then what, is, what can happen is you get changed from glory, look at it again, to glory, look in there again, to ever-increasing glory. Gradually, progressively, becoming more and more like the image of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? This is causing you to become more and more conformed to the image of His Son. Okay? This is causing you to be more and more like the image of his son. Now the last one. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are you understanding that this is how the walk plays out? You, it's not a, well, I have to go and go to church and I have to live godly and I have to dress in a certain way because this is what God would have us do and I know this is a godly thing and so I guess I'll do this, you know. And, and, and now I say it like that, but a lot of people say, I have to live, this is a wonderful way to live and I do this by, by my conviction and this is what I'm doing for God. Guess what? It's the same nonsense. If that's something you're willing up in your, in your, in your will and purpose and thinking you're doing stuff for God, quit it. Just stop, Okay. Just stop and, 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 let, and let the issue of your modesty or your, your service or your ministry be as it, it's, it's flowing in and through and out of you because you understand, I really like being next to him. What a wonderful place to rest. What a wonderful place of security. What a wonderful place of acknowledged dependence on the power and supply of God. And I don't have to worry about my ministry. That's his business. He just asked me to be faithful. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. I, I, I lived that verse for years thinking that word is supposed to be, you're supposed to be successful. And when I wasn't successful in my plans, depression, guilt. This is what I talked about before. It's not about you, it's about what God's purpose is. And the more you will study your Bible and understand what God's doing in context of the spiritual warfare, in context of heaven and earth, the connections versus the distinctions, body of Christ versus Israel, understanding who you are, what you're to be about, what He's doing according to His will and His plan and purpose, man, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be a powerhouse as a parent, as a, as a spouse, as a minister, as a teacher, as a worker, whatever you are, you're going to be doing what 2 Corinthians 4 we're going to read about right now. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, do you realize that every blood-bought believer is a minister of Jesus Christ? You don't have to go to seminary to become a minister. You're a minister. The issue is this. Everybody look up here. The issue with ministry is how effective is your ministry? And that depends on all this stuff we've been doing here, okay? Understanding who you are in Jesus Christ. Understanding what God's plan and purpose is for the body. Understanding what your destiny is there in the heavenly places. Judging angels and so forth. Ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Having an inheritance. On and on and on and on. Your identity gives you everything that's worth anything eternally of any value at all. It's because of your identity in Jesus Christ, see? And so we read on, it says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's what? 
conscience in the sight of God. You know where your conscience is? It's, it's over here in the soul aspect, your heart. That's, the brother and I were talking just before this. That when I, when people, Calvinists say that you're, you're so dead that you can't believe God. He has to give you the faith to do that. That's nonsense, by the way. Because the appeal of the gospel, the persuasive appeal of the gospel is made not to the spirit anyway. It's made to the soul. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, okay? So you, when you share the gospel with somebody, you're, you're, you're believing God to persuade others about what has happened through what he did through Jesus Christ, okay? That, that's, that's where that goes. And then, upon belief, the spirit is quickened. It's made alive and becomes active and in relationship again. That death is canceled, okay? Okay, does that make sense? And so we read on, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, who's that? Satan, okay, he's got a plan of evil, hath did what? He's blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, okay, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your service for Jesus' sake. Apostle Paul couldn't save anybody, and you can't either, but you can share the gospel it does, okay? The gospel of Christ, okay, who is the image of God. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in these precious solid gold vessels, We have this treasure in mud jugs, okay? An earthen vessel. How come? I know you. If anything good comes out of you, it must be of God, <laughs> you know? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Okay. I, ho I hope that helps because I know, again, in conversation with people this weekend, I know people struggle with this issue. Brother Gabbard, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, how I'm supposed to behave, but I fail all the time. How do I do it? That's how you do it. You come up here to the Father, and you put your head right here. And then you walk on with him. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love, uh, your precious unlimited grace, uh, your, your unmerited favor toward people like us. We thank you for each precious saint, each brother and sister who are here this morning and uh, enjoying fellowship with one another, uh, desiring, Father, to uh, live in a closer way, to walk in a stronger and more powerful way, to, to uh, accomplish things to your glory and to your praise. And now, Father, help us please to uh, just continue to grow in our understanding of the fact that we can depend on you for these things. We can depend on you for our ministry. We can depend on, on you for our life as uh, your children and indeed as your sons uh, of, of, of God being conformed more and more to the image of the Son. Uh, again, Father, thank you for this uh, great time of fellowship we've enjoyed this weekend. Thank you most of all for uh, your word and for the fact that it tells us of the preciousness of our Savior who died in our place. And we thank you for all these things in his precious and matchless name. Uh, amen. All right, brothers, thank you very much.